Hey, hey, Mark Thrym and Marcus House with you here and welcome to our collaborative series of the SpaceX ITS Mars colonization mission. If you haven't already viewed earlier parts, check them out here. In part three, we landed the interplanetary transport ship on the surface of Mars for the first time, but now it's time to start the difficult task of setting up the very first Martian colony in order to actually survive on the red planet. Let's make the assumption that only 10 humans will make up the first Mars mission. And actually, let's also assume that we have five years to set up a base that can be fully self-sustaining, well, without additional food sent from Earth, that is. Now, because the ITS will be designed to transport 100 people with required cargo, for this mission, all the remaining space that would normally be taken up by the other 90 people can be used instead for more cargo, a lot more, in fact. Astronauts on the International Space Station currently consume around 3.8 pounds or 1.7 kilograms of food per day. So just over three tons of food per person will be required for the five year trip. So 30 tons of food for the entire crew of 10 astronauts should keep them well fed and happy for five years. Well, hopefully happy. Water, of course, is largely recyclable, and additional water can also be obtained quite easily from the Martian surface, so a few tons of water should be more than enough for the entire crew. Now, the SpaceX documentation suggests that the ITS is capable of delivering 450 tons of cargo to Mars, so let's overestimate our food and water needs for the five years and make the assumption that we have around 400 tons of cargo space allocated for equipment and cargo. The primary mission for our first 10 astronauts will be to establish a small propellant plant on the Martian surface. These brave human settlers will need to be very good at digging beneath the surface and hauling up buried ice, which will then provide the water needed to make the liquid methane and liquid oxygen propellant. The fuel will then be stored and this would allow future ships to be refueled and returned to Earth. At the same time, mining operations could double as a construction job, allowing the hollowed out mined space to be utilized as a habitation or storage area. There are many wonderful 3D printed habitat concepts being presented lately, and NASA in particular is offering a substantial cash prize with their 3D printed habitat challenge. This prize challenges inventors to create new ways to build habitat modules where future space explorers can live and work, the competition asks inventors to use readily available and recyclable materials to 3D print these habitat segments. So who knows what 3D printing machine may be possible in the near future. As the mining facility gets underway, in parallel a series of transparent domes could be erected outside to serve as greenhouses. This would allow the first plants to be grown with step one of this process perhaps being to experiment with algae farms. There have been several proposals actually suggesting that algae could essentially produce nutrient-rich food quite rapidly. There could then be trial vegetables growing alongside, such as potatoes and peas and that sort of thing. Tests done so far in similar soil types found on Earth to that found on Mars does seem to indicate that quite a few plants should grow well in the Martian soil. Even more interesting are proposals experimenting with insect farms, which could provide an efficient source of protein, which will also, at the same time, consume and process many different kinds of bio-waste as raw material. I mean, who wouldn't want excrement-fed insects to form part of their balanced diet? I mean, it seems like a no-brainer to us. In the long term, being able to send many thousands of people in many ships simultaneously is the goal here. The success or failure of the first few human exploration missions, though, will determine how fast we can build the infrastructure needed to ferry settlers to Mars from Earth. Two years after our ship launched to establish the first base on Mars, the propellant plant is now operational, the ship has slowly been refueled, and the ship is now ready to launch. This refueled ship can launch a huge volume of samples and experiments back to Earth, and escaping gravity on Mars is of course much easier than Earth due to the lower orbital velocity required to reach a stable orbit, as well as of course the very thin atmosphere on Mars. This all makes for a much more efficient launch, also quite free from the heavy atmospheric drag that we face here on Earth. 
Of course, the very first ship may perhaps stay on Mars and form a more permanent part of the first base of operations. It could even be left here as an historic landmark as an example. It would depend largely, we imagine, on the status of the first base and how the colonists have gone creating the space they need to be comfortable until the next ship launches to Mars. Speaking of which, while our ship here is heading back to Earth, a new ship has been constructed and launched to make its first journey to Mars. This ship, which we'll imaginatively call Ship 2, is now loaded with 50 new astronauts skilled in a variety of fields. Scientists, botanists, engineers, builders and many other skill sets will provide a huge set of combined experience for the growing colony on Mars. Of course, along with this new crew, a new mother load of cargo will be coming with them to Mars to join our already established colony. In another short few months, our little Mars colony will have grown to accommodate five times the number of abled bodies. Along with the new added settlers, new equipment unloaded from the cargo bay will have been redesigned based on the hugely valuable data obtained from the first 10 Martians already inhabiting the colony. As Ship 2 heads to Mars, Ship 1, finally after its long journey back from the Red Planet, reaches Earth's atmosphere where it can aerobrake in a controlled manner until the velocity has been reduced enough to fully come into land. Ship 1 will touch down with the very first samples from Mars ever returned to Earth, ready to be refurbished for its next exciting mission, perched up of course on one of the many boosters that have now been manufactured to send the growing number of ships to Mars, perhaps even to other exciting locations in our solar system. So we hope you enjoyed part four of our Mars colonization mission. Thank you everyone for your support and to our fantastic subscribers for following our channels. If you haven't subscribed and you have enjoyed these videos, please do subscribe to see more. And of course, any comments, likes and shares are all very much appreciated. Thank you for watching. We love you all and we'll see you in the next video.